Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video and welcome to my February wrap up. Today I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the month of February. So I read 12 or 12 and a bit things in February um, and I'll start off as I usually do with some classics, some old books. Um, I read quite a lot of Victorian things in February actually. It was quite a Victorian month which was kind of nice and I had quite a few rereads too. So one thing that I read in February was Hard Times by Charles Dickens. Um, this was the pick for the Mega Dickens read along this month. I've made a whole individual video about Hard Times talking about my reflections in a lot more detail so I'll leave a link to that down below and I won't talk about it for too much here but I really enjoyed my reread of this. This was my fourth or fifth time reading it I guess um, and I listened to the audiobook narrated by Bertie Cavill which was really good this is a novel that I think um, really improves on a reread as well because it is a sort of more political philosophical Dickens than some of his books it's set in the fictional town of Coketown which is inspired by Preston and it's an industrial city um, with a lot of factories in and we are following various characters focusing on um, Mr Gradgrind and his family Mr Gradgrind is a fan of utilitarianism and political economy he only believes in facts he wants nothing but facts imagination um, has no place in his world and he has brought up his children to believe only in facts and to reject imagination and this book is kind of about how damaging that is and what happens when he and his family come into interaction with um, a young girl called Sissy Jupe who has been brought up by circus performers um, and has a very different view of the world and it's really fantastic and really great um, and I just really really love it a lot so yeah I'll leave my other video down below but this was a great reread this month. Then I also read The Dead Secret by Wilkie Collins from 1856. Um, I wanted to read some Wilkie Collins this month partly for the We Love Jenny readathon which is all about celebrating the life of Jennifer Brooks who was a fantastic booktuber who very sadly passed away in January um, and she really loved Wilkie Collins so I wanted to pick up some Wilkie Collins this month in honour of that readathon and her um, and I picked up The Dead Secret which I listened to on audiobook. I would say that in general I find Wilkie Collins very hit or miss like I love a lot of his books and I have really disliked quite a few of his books too. The Dead Secret was I guess a more sort of middling read like it was a good solid enjoyable read but it definitely didn't rank up with um the Wilkie Collins greats such as Armadale, Man and Wife and um, The Moonstone or with The Woman in White. The Dead Secret begins with a dying woman um writing a confession to her husband about a secret. Her maid signs it as a witness um, and she makes her maid promise on her deathbed um, to not destroy this note and to not take it out of the house and then before she can get her maid to swear to give the letter to her husband the woman dies. We then see the maid hide this letter in the house um, somewhere where she thinks it will never be found and then we move kind of 16 years into the future where we're following um, the daughter of the couple in the kind of prologue bit um, and obviously somehow she is going to end up um, coming into contact with this secret. It was an interesting read with um, some wonderful characterization. I thought Sarah was a really interesting character um, and Uncle Joseph was fantastic. He was really interesting and actually um, Uncle Joseph is a character who is German um, and he faces a lot of xenophobia from other particular characters and Wilkie Collins does quite a lot in um, The Dead Secret to criticize that xenophobia in a way that I thought was really well done um, and really interesting. I will say that I did guess the secret like fairly early on in the story um, like quite a way before the secret is revealed but I kind of didn't mind that like I still really enjoyed the reading experience and I enjoyed Wilkie Collins's writing style. I think the element of the novel that didn't work for me was um, the kind of central relationship so um, the daughter who we meet you know 16 17 years later after the prologue bit when we first meet her she is getting married um, and the relationship between her and her husband um, at times I found like a little um, hard to credit and hard to believe. She is very like hot-headed and has a big temper and he's a real snob um and those two things don't make either of them especially likable but also he's very critical about her temper um in a way that also felt like quite patronizing so I just kind of slightly struggle with the relationship between them. The husband Mr Franklin is also blind and Wilkie Collins depicts him as um, relatively helpless which I also found slightly frustrating um, and actually very interesting because I have also read another book by Wilkie Collins, um, Poor Miss Finch, in which the main character is blind and in Poor Miss Finch 
Miss Finch is absolutely not helpless in any way um, and she has a lot more independence um, and it's a very different depiction of a character with blindness. Poor Miss Finch is from quite a bit later on in his career I think um, and also Miss Finch has been blind all her life whereas Mr Franklin um, went blind sort of a, a year ago maybe so obviously they're having a very very different experience of that but I also slightly struggle with the way Wilkie Collins depicted that. However I did think it was a really interesting novel um, and definitely like I said there are some Wilkie Collins books that I've absolutely hated and definitely The Dead Secret it wasn't anywhere um, near to the, the bottom of my Wilkie Collins ranking, um, but I just don't think it was quite as strong as some of the strongest books by him. I'll keep on reading Wilkie Collins. At some point, I will probably get through them all. While we're talking of authors that I want to read everything by, I also read an Anthony Trollope book this month. I read this, which is um, The Struggles of Brown, Jones and Robinson. This is a novel from 1862, and it's a very different Anthony Trollope book. It's definitely one of his more like shorter focused novels, um, and it looks at quite a different like social group to the group you usually find at Anthony Trollope books. In general, Anthony Trollope books um, skew a bit more like aristocratic or at least like upper middle class. Whereas this book is about a group of, I guess, upper working class characters. So in this book, um, a man called Mr. Brown inherits some money um, after his wife's death. Um, and he decides that he wants to um, use his money to go into business to set up a firm of some description. Um, so he ends up going into partnership with his son-in-law, Mr. Jones. Um, and um, his want-to-be son-in-law, Mr. Robinson, who is really in love with his other daughter, um, but they can't quite um, see eye to eye. And so these three men go into partnership together to start a haberdashery shop. Mr. Brown is kind of in charge of the finances. Mr. Jones is kind of in charge of stuff on the shop floor. And Mr. Robinson is in charge of the advertising. And George Robinson really is a fan of false advertising. Um, and quite a lot of this book is about his advertising um, exploits and his um, increasingly wild advertisements um, and his increasingly mad attempts to bring more people to the shop. And this book kind of is chiefly about this enterprise um, and then partly also about George Robinson trying to woo Mr Brown's daughter um, who isn't really sure whether she wants to marry him or marry the butcher who lives down the road whose um, income is a bit more secure. However one interesting element of this book is that we also have this like preface at the beginning where George Robinson writes in first person that this is his account of what happened between them and then the book carries on in third person as Anthony Trollope's books usually are but we always know throughout the third person perspective that it is George Robinson writing this like we know that this is George Robinson's view of what happened which um is actually really really fun because we know from the beginning that George Robinson doesn't like Mr Jones and so you always know that everything about Mr Jones is a bit biased and that like George Robinson's um descriptions of himself as you know an advertising genius are very biased um, and that his view on the women um especially on the young woman that he in love with is definitely biased and so even though this is a book written in third person you get like the bias of a first person unreliable narrator which is quite fun and I just really enjoyed this book it was quite a different Anthony Trollope book like I said looking at a different social group um, and a different theme I guess you know there's a lot in here about shopkeeping and advertising which is not something you read about very much in Victorian literature um, and the way this book looked at yeah like Victorian marketing basically it was just really interesting so I really enjoyed this it was really good fun. I wouldn't say it's a great Anthony Trollope book to start with maybe because it is a bit niche um, but I also really liked it so definitely one I'd recommend. Then I reread two more Victorian books in February. Um, so I reread Carmilla by J. Sheridan Le Fanu from 1872. This is a very short gothic novella with a lot of lesbian subtext um, which follows the arrival of a mysterious young woman called Carmilla at the house of a young woman called Laura. Laura is both kind of repelled by and attracted to Carmilla um, and they strike up a slightly odd friendship but meanwhile Laura is growing Ill and strange things are happening. I really love Carmilla but I hadn't read it for quite a few years um, and I found a free audiobook of it so I really enjoyed Carmilla. I think it's a great story um, and definitely as traditional vampire books go definitely so much better than Dracula for me and I really like it a lot. Then I also reread The Rebecca Rioter by Amy Dillwyn in February. This is a Victorian novel from 1880 um, which is set in Wales in the 1840s um, around the Rebecca riots which were real historical events um, where men were 
um, dressing up as the biblical character of Rebecca in order to protest taxes and especially turnpike poles. And in this book, we're following um, the first person perspective of a young man called Evan who kind of gets caught up in these riots. So I reread this in February because at some point in March slash April, um, I'm going to be on a podcast um, called She Wrote Too, which is all about um, lesser known women writers. And we're going to be talking about Amy Dillwyn, which I'm really excited for because I love Amy Dillwyn and I think she's very underrated. And we're mostly going to be focusing on the Rebecca writer. Um, and I had read the Rebecca writer for quite a few years so I thought I would reread it and I did a bit of tabbing and annotating which I don't usually do when I read so that was kind of fun um and yeah I really enjoyed my reread of the Rebecca writer it's a much darker book than I think I remembered it being partly I think because Jill and a burglary the two books I've read by Amy Dillwyn since um have a slightly different tone or a slightly different energy I guess so it's kind of interesting to reread the Rebecca writer and like see a different side of Amy Dillwyn's writing I guess it was also quite interesting to reread it um having reread Barnaby Rudge by Charles Dickens not all that long ago and that also being a book about riots with a very different context um but like the two ways these books look at um kind of mob mentality um and people who don't fully understand the consequences of what they're doing getting caught up in things like I thought that was really really interesting it was also really interesting I was reading the introduction and apparently Amy Dillwyn's father was um involved in like quashing the riots so that Amy Dillwyn chose to write a novel from the perspective of a rioter that's really interesting um so yeah I just thought this was a really interesting read and yeah very good to reread this one and then um before we move away from the Victorians I also started to read Varney the Vampire in February Varney the Vampire by James Malcolm Ryder was a penny dreadful that was published serially um from 1845 to 1847 it is massive um this is just volume one this is just half of it um and it was a ongoing penny dreadful um about a vampire um, and various people fighting against this vampire and this was one of my picks for the We Love Jenny readathon because Varney the Vampire was Jennifer Brooks's favourite Victorian novel and she just spoke about it so amazingly and made it sound so fantastic and so fun um, and so I've been really excited to pick it up for a while and I wanted to start it in February. I have read about um, 150 pages I would say. It is quite a slow read because um, this edition is set out in columns and it's also such a huge heavy book that I'm not really going to take it out the house with me so I think basically I'm going to read this very slowly over the course of a lot of months but I am really enjoying it so far it is very fun and melodramatic in a way that I'm just really really enjoying and it's really interesting to see all the different like vampire tropes um and also some of them being overturned so like in the very beginning we have um this very like damsel in distress um passive victim character of flora this young woman who is attacked by a vampire and then like two nights later when her brothers go on a mission to to do something that they think will hopefully tell them whether or not it was definitely a vampire she was attacked by she just says to them well you better give me a gun then so i can protect myself and she takes her brother's pistol and is ready to shoot a vampire and she sort of like overturns that passive victim trope um so i think there's some kind of really interesting things going on here um also embedded in lots of silly melodrama which I'm just finding really really fun so it's been really lovely to read this and yeah I definitely see why Jennifer Brooks loved this so much and I'm really looking forward to reading on with it. Right we're done with the Victorian books but I do still have a few more classics to speak about and um, so one thing that I read in February was this um this is a streetcar named Desire by Tennessee Williams this is a play and this was another reread for me. I'm in a book club where every time we read a play a short story and a poetry collection and this was the most recent drama pick um so I had read this before when I was at school and I've also seen it on stage before um, but it's been quite a long time since I revisited it. I did think this was really fantastic like I do think it is an amazing play but I feel like I like this slightly less this time than last time but I do think that it is a fantastic play in terms of the sort of tense nature of it and the tragedy and the kind of like power of the ending um so this book is about um two sisters one sister called blanche comes to stay with her sister stella who lives with her husband in a very small flat and it's basically about the tensions between these three people in this flat and yeah i thought it was a really interesting play but i'm not sure that i loved it quite as much on this reading as I have done previously. Then I also read a Nigerian classic from 1952 and that's this, this is The Palm Wine Drinkard by Amos Tutuola. 
And this was a really interesting, very strange book. It is exceptionally surreal, and I'm not sure I fully understood what went on, but I also kind of found it really interesting and quite an enjoyable, strange ride to go along, I guess. This book is basically about a man who um, drinks a lot of palm wine, and after his palm wine taps the dies, he doesn't have good enough palm wine, so he decides to go kind of to the afterlife to find his palm wine tapster but he ends up going on this journey of like years and years and years into strange different worlds some of which are kind of afterlife and some of which are just sort of like alternative realities alternative worlds and in these alternative worlds he has kind of some degree of magical power and it's basically about his journey through these worlds and i would say it's a mixture of like folklore and surrealism i found it really interesting but it definitely is quite an odd book like i'm not really sure what to make of it um but i'm glad i read it and yeah an interesting read. Then the short story pick for my book club um, this month was Bright Thursdays by Olive Senior, which is from this collection, Summer Lightning and Other Stories. Um, I read Summer Lightning and Other Stories last year and really loved it. So I wanted to pick Bright Thursdays for our book club because I just thought it was such a fantastic story. And I loved rereading it in February. I just think Olive Senior is such a talented writer and I just think Bright Thursdays is genuinely one of my favorite short stories ever. Like, I just think it's incredible. I should say this is a Jamaican short story from 1987. It's about a young girl who is sent to live with her grandparents, who she doesn't really know very well. She's never really met her father. Um, and it's about her time living in this very different home, um, missing her mother and feeling out of place. And it's just moving and incredible and beautiful and really sad, but in a really fantastically poignant way and it's just it's just so great so I highly highly recommend that and then the poetry pick for my book club this month was this this is Birthday Letters by Ted Hughes which I think was first published in 1998 um, a few months before Ted Hughes's death and quite a lot of this collection is about his relationship with Sylvia Plath and I think that he hadn't really ever written about her in his poetry before but in this his last collection like a lot of the poems are kind of about her and about their relationship this was an interesting read for me because i feel like for the first half of the collection i was absolutely loving it like I found so much in here that was really interesting um, and really poignant and sad and complicated. And actually what it most put me in mind of was Thomas Hardy's 1912 to 1913 poems. And that is probably my favourite poetry collection ever. So I really enjoyed the way that this poetry collection conjured um, Hardy's poems. And I feel like that mixture of like nostalgia and memory and affection and regret was kind of done really well in um, Birthday Letters in the same way that it was done in Thomas Hardy's poems however I will say that this is a very long collection like it's like 200 pages which for a poetry collection is pretty long and most of the poems themselves are very long sort of three or four pages and by the second half of the poetry collection I did feel like it had dragged a bit like I do kind of feel that this poetry collection would have been stronger if it had been half the length with um just the best poems selected like it felt like it just went on a little bit too long um so I did find it really interesting but I feel like I thought the first half was fantastic and then by the second half I was slightly losing momentum and then finally I did read three 21st century books in February um so one book that I read was The Smallest Man by Francis Quinn I didn't actually read this physical edition I actually listened to an audiobook I've been trying to work my way through my um long-term physical TBR and I've been trying to listen to a few books on audiobook um in order to kind of get myself through my physical TBR faster um so I got the audiobook out of the library um and listened to that this book is set in the 17th century and it follows quite a long period of time um, covering the English Civil War and it's basically the coming of age story of Nat Davy um, who is said to be the smallest man in England and Nat Davy is inspired by a real historical figure Geoffrey Hudson um, who had dwarfism and who was a courtier to um, the wife of King Charles I um, and this book is basically Nat Davy's coming of age story we follow his childhood um, and what happens when he ends up basically getting sold by his father to a duke to give as a gift to the Queen when he's about 10 years old and we follow him through his life his experiences in the civil war and his love story and so on there are a lot of things that i've really enjoyed about this book nat's a really interesting character and i especially loved his friendship with jeremiah um, another of the courtiers and they just have a really great friendship which is really well explored one thing i will say is that the kind of love story element of this book does have quite a lot of like miscommunication in which i know is something that bothers um quite a lot of readers so i think that's kind of worth being aware of that that is quite a big element but in general i enjoyed this and i thought it was an interesting read
read. Then I also read Begin Again by Heli Acton, which is, um, let's say, a speculative rom-com. Um, so this is a book about a woman called Frankie who, on her 36th birthday, um, dies very, very suddenly. And when she dies, she's taken to a place called The Station, where she is told that um, because she has died very young, she can have the chance to go back um, to her life if she wants to. Um, but she actually has the choice to go back to several different versions of her life. Um, so the person in this place, the station, um, says, I can show you what your life would be like in lots of different scenarios if you've made a different decision at a pivotal moment in your life. So Frankie ends up going back and living for 24 hours in, I think, four or five different lives um, in order to see what her life would have been like if she'd made different decisions. And then at the end, she has to pick which life she wants to return to. I really enjoyed this book. It combines like all the fun of a sort of sliding doors narrative with also like a really fun um afterlife device um that kind of reminded me of the good place and was just really enjoyable it's very very funny but it's also very poignant um in a way that heli acton like always pulls off really really well and i just uh, thoroughly enjoyed it i felt like all the characterization was really well done um, and the way frankie's like different lives tell her different things about herself and what she values and doesn't value about herself and what she doesn't prioritize enough in her life like i just thought all that was done really really well and the way this book focuses on friendship so much was excellent i just i just thought it was fantastic so i highly highly recommend this then finally i also read meredith alone by claire alexander um this like begin again is a proof copy though this has been out for a little while um and this book is about a woman called meredith she is 39 years old and she hasn't left her house for 1200 days and in this book we follow meredith both in the present um her daily life um, her interactions with her friends and especially with two new friends that she makes at the beginning of the book one through an online community to support people who are lonely and one through a charity which basically provides visitors to people who are isolated and we follow Meredith's everyday life but we also follow her past um, through flashbacks and kind of learn what has led to um, her isolation and what has led to her choosing to keep herself in her house. I found this book exceptionally readable. I read it like more or less in one sitting on an evening on a work day which almost never happens like I do read books in one sitting but it tends to be like if I'm on holiday or if I have a day that I've dedicated fully to reading but for me to start a book at like 6 p.m and have finished it by the time I go to bed like that is a very very readable book um and it was very very compulsive it has very short chapters and just a really engaging writing style and Meredith is such an engaging character and I feel like the balance of past and present was done really really well I also felt that this book um looked at Meredith's reasons for saying at home and her mental health in a very complicated and nuanced um, and well done way. It becomes clear relatively early on that there has been some trigger, some incident that has led to her deciding not to leave her house in order to protect herself. But we do also see in the flashbacks that she did struggle with her mental health before this point. So while the incident that led to her isolation um, has really changed her life, there were also a lot of other things going on before then. We learn a lot about her childhood and her relationship with her sister and her mother. Um, and it's just all really well done. I thought the characterization was done so well and it's so great as a book about friendship and I really loved the value this book put on friendship um, and how friendship is really the key to Meredith's recovery I guess. I just thought this was a really fantastic book and it also felt like um, the right book at the right time. I feel like maybe I've been having like a bit of a low-key reading slump in February that I wasn't really aware of until I read this book and like flew through it and just thought yeah this was just what I needed. So yeah I thought this was really really fantastic and definitely one I'd recommend. So yeah those are all the books that I read in February. Um, lots of classics and a few other things as well. Um, so do let me know down in the comments have you read any of these books? What did you think of them? That's all for now and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video. Bye.